I suppose one of the things I wanted to mention was I was always astounded by that fact that that um, the bar, that Qatar consumes over nine Earths, and mm -hmm. that, just to comprehend that in, in any capacity is like is 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 almost surreal in a way to know that 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 is the case. And it, it's, we're really talking about ecological footprint, not carbon emissions, even though. They're all, everything's banded together, isn't it? Even like plastics put together as something that's attached to climate change. But it's, it, it is indirectly, but it's not really the, the driver of climate change. And I think, I just want to get across just the fact. I th actually, I think one of the things I think about this, I think it's about scale. I think people can't believe, the, the deniers and the people on the edge, that we can't believe that mankind can actually affect climate because we're so insignificant to Earth, and that probably is a religious connotation to that. But the but the the Earth is. I mean, we're seeing this with Google Earth and stuff. That the Earth is totally distorted by our actions, and, and, and we can see that in real time. We had five main partners for the film. Brazil, Lebanon, Vietnam, the UK and Indonesia. And that's why you can see only a selection uh, of countries from around the world. We couldn't show all of them. But we almost reached all the continents as the project attracted so much attention that finally we managed to include more stories than only from those five countries. So just something to say about the cubes as well, the squares, it's like we took the nine based on guitar and then, then depending on the country, the, the number of squares we rounded up or down would actually reveal what that person's ecological footprint would be. But then in a way, with conversations with Mark, it was really like about, it's not that person, it's that country. And then how do you start dividing up? Because really it's the 10% or the 1% that really are the consumers, not, you know, every country has those 1% and 10%, just different degrees of those. So it's, that's the thing I still struggle with in a way, because we don't really want to call people out or, or, or make them feel bad about their lifestyles. We just want them to make them aware I think that's the big difference. So that's one of the things that I do in my research is um, do ethnographic research on different cultures that includes sort of subcultures within, you know, my own country and so forth. Uh, so we came up with some, um, some categories related to consumption and climate with Mark Maslin. Um, and we use those as a starting point to um, approach the film and approach the project. And uh, for me, it comes down to a couple of questions. Um, one is, you know, what can these individual stories like you see on screen, what can they tell us collectively about global consumption and climate change? Um, that was one question. The other question is, can this work as a kind of ethnographic research? You know, can we're all sitting, you know, in our homes because of COVID, of course. And even if if not for that, you know, I couldn't travel to all of these countries, you know, and, and study each of these cultures individually for various reasons. So can it work remotely like that, you know, mediated through each uh, artist in each country who's doing the filming? Uh, so that was a, a huge challenge, an interesting challenge. So we took that, took that, that challenge. These all are tied in together and it was always about consumption for me. It was like this fascinating aspect about different locations around the world and how, how people really are the same. You know, it's like as much as they'll tell us these things are differently, they are, people are the same. They still have, they're not, you know. And I suppose the thing also was when we were filming and doing stuff, I, we realized that we needed to interview people as well because you, again, it's that idea where you can have this, you can, as Kevin was saying, information, you can assume things. Mm -hmm. And there's, 
uh, you know, there's different stories to these things. Someone mentioned earlier in the chat too that, you know, you're really seeing into like intimate parts of people's lives, you know, shopping and, and doing all the things you see on screen. And it's, it's, just, it's kind of a strange thing, you know, to just go into someone's life like that. Only now is it's almost we're starting to see the project and sort of see, explore the different directions. But that is quite a hard one to get across, you know, ecological footprint. In, um, carbon footprint and and really countries, people, lifestyles. It's like how do you sort of uh, simulate that all together and and, sort of, and give people that message really? Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping Sean is going to interrupt us when we're meant to finish. I'm not sure how how late we're meant yeah, to go. Yeah, it's finished now actually. It's come yeah, to the end. Just one thing, going back to what Mark said about climate activists, the noise of the youth referencing Daisy's work. I think the noise of the everyday is what Nine Earths focuses on. It's, you know, building bridges between the local and the global on a scale that is usually unheard of. Climate change related artworks often refer to guilt and how we respond to failure. And here we are kind of steering away from the grip of guilt in order to empower people to be part of the conversation, be part of this dialogue. Whether you're a scientist and have a quote to share, or you're just a person in the street willing to share your daily life, that is part of the discussion about the future and the present and how we all can tackle climate change. Because this is a global issue that we all need to tackle on a local scale as well.